<laughs> okay. So I started studying judo and Japanese jiu-jitsu. I think I was a little bit younger than 10, but I eventually got my black belt. Um, and this really introduced me to China, Japanese culture and um, to some of the philosophy behind the movements of martial arts. And I got really fascinated by it and also became a samurai movie junkie. So this is a clip from uh, the trilogy about Miyamoto Musashi, who was probably the most famous samurai that ever lived. When he retired, he uh, kind of went into a more peaceful lifestyle and he devoted himself to painting and poetry. So his pen name is Niten. And this is fairly common for people to choose a separate name for their artistic work. Uh, this other painting here is by Seshu who is one of the greats of Japanese art history. Um, you can see he's got this uh, use of the brush that is so free and so confident. And his, his use of spaciousness, it really caught my attention and it really embodied a lot of um, the philosophy that I had learned through martial arts. So I had always wanted to travel to Japan uh, as a kid, as a samurai uh, um, fan. And I didn't think I could afford to being a starving, a starving artist, but I found out that with a bachelor's degree and being a native English speaker, that's all I needed to get a job there. Um, I didn't have to be an English major, so I applied and I ended up moving to Japan uh, to try it out. And one year turned eventually into eight. So you can see I lived in a few different places, always in the South. I spent a good amount of time uh, with a studio in Kamiyama, which is one of the most beautiful places on earth. I also lived in Maksa. Um, I was in a little fishing village. Mm -hmm. So my house is right here. And these two other photos are from both sides of my house. So I was right between the ocean and the mountains. One thing that really struck me when I first got to Japan was these paintings that I had always admired and thought were really stylized were not. <laughs> uh, the landscape was really just as vertical as it looked in these paintings and often as angular. So it kind of blew my mind that it wasn't really an exaggeration. So this is my studio in Amaksa. Uh, this is my studio in Kamiyama. Uh, it was in an old shoe factory. Um, I shared it with several other artists. We would have open studios sometimes and we'd exhibit around town. Uh, I also showed in Amaksa uh, several times, uh, solo and with groups. Um, and I had two solo shows when I was in Tokyo, or in Tokyo when I was in Japan. <laughs> uh, and in my time, I, I made a bunch of great friends uh, and I can't wait to go back whenever that's possible. Um, all right, so that's that. <laughs> Great. And Patty, you want to jump in with your slides? And don't forget to unmute yourself, Patty. Hello? I can hear it. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. I never tried to share the screen with the camera. So, uh, I don't know. Can you hear me? Am I? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I spent a total of 12 years in Asia, um, two years in Hong Kong, eight years in Beijing, and then another two in Japan. Um, I'm going to focus the talk um, tonight on Beijing uh, because um, that's where um, I had a lot of development that happened in my work in Beijing. Um, 
So uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming and thank Allison and Chalice for joining me in this. Um, so here, um, uh, we moved to Beijing in 2007. I, I was with my family, my husband and my two children. Um, we came to Beijing for a number of reasons. My husband had a job opportunity. There was a really active art community in Beijing and we wanted to, the kids to learn Mandarin. Um, so we ended up, uh, we weren't expecting to stay as long as we did, but um, in some ways, maybe I would never have left. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. So when we moved in 2007, um, it was a really exciting time. China was in transition. They were about to host the Olympics. Um, so the entire city was like a movie set. There was new international pieces of architecture um, opening up like one right after the other, all getting uh, very cute Chinese nicknames. Um, and uh, gates were being painted. Um, the Forbidden City, which you see here on the left, was also getting a paint job. Um, and the, it, it, it was just, there was a lot of enthusiasm. Um, so also at that time, um, capitalism had taken hold. Um, there's no signs of, of being a communist country. Um, and there was a rising middle class. So economically, there were, um, you know, just changes happening before our eyes. So this is what my artwork looked like when I arrived in Beijing. Um, I was responding to nature, um, had memories of my life in Vermont, my garden, and um, I was investigating the line as a mathematical shape. So I worked on um, with graphite. Um, it's kind of a hard material on plastic, so a very hard surface. And I used eraser, and I just um, erased and perfected the line as I went. Um, shortly after I got to Beijing, I met the curator, Catherine Chung. Um, she, she worked with many international and local artists in the art districts of um, Heichao, Huantia, 798, and Caotandi. These were all on the east side of Beijing, and um, you could go from one to the next. Um, there were artists and galleries um, and startups and all kinds of things happening there. Um, she was critical um, in not only introducing me, but introducing many international artists to the local art scene in Beijing. Um, and she also gave many local artists opportunities abroad. So she used to host dinners in her Hutong uh, and would invite writers, artists, diplomats, and a lot of thinkers to gather. Well, we used to call her the, the Gertrude Stein of Beijing, because um, we would also come to her with our troubles and um, you know, our worries, and uh, she was amazing. She took care of us, and she always had a bright spirit. So she was, um, uh, well, like if you dropped into her home just unannounced, there was always something going on there. It was always something interesting going on at her house. So, um, so not, not far from my studio, there were many um, these little art markets which would sell um, like really affordable compared to what we pay for art supplies, very affordable art supplies. And they also had these um, bookstores which would sell these copy books. So no matter what you wanted to learn, gouache painting, anatomy, um, you know, and there would be reproductions of Leonardo or Van Gogh. And I was really drawn to these images. Um, this is an ink painting uh, copy book. Um, basically, uh, this one uh, was, was focusing on drapery. Mm. So I copied the forms and um, integrated them into my work. And um, still using the graphite on plastic technique. So eventually these sort of evolved into these daily sketches. So I was trying to become more fluent in um, using the line and the, this uh, you know, laborious process I was using here. Um, I, I, I wanted to do 
so much was coming at me that I needed to work in a style that would uh, allow um, these all these images to move through me uh, uh, more rapidly. Um, so uh, the other thing is I learned that these um, these outline shapes um, that that uh, were in ink painting were uh, the, the outlines were called the bones or the skeletons of the drawings because they provided the structure to the work. So here I'm uh, playing around with um, peony shapes. Um, so at this time, um, you know, I was, I was studying the language and learning to communicate. Uh, but uh, when I told people I was an artist, um, the first question they would say, ask me, and this was consistent, was, are you an ink painter or are you an oil painter? And I sort of had this difficult time of describing, like, what kind of artist I was. I didn't have enough vocabulary to say, oh, I draw with graphite on plastic and this and that. And I, I, it had been 10 years since I oil painted, but I had a beautiful studio and there were these like affordable art supplies. And so I decided to, after 10 years to return to oil painting. Um, so of course I'm not working with color. So I was observing color um, that you find um, maybe like in the markets or in people's homes, these kind of poster designs. And um, I began to, I integrate them in my work and my work also got larger and um, I integrated the colors into those um, skeleton forms that I was drawing on, on paper. Um, so then I had another artist um, kind of, I, 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 my studio was in, in a little art city. Um, and and um, so there were all artist studios up and down. And um, so artists would come in and out and we'd talk about each other's work and that I, I, I could, I could communicate just about that, um, but but one artist came in one day, and and still, I, I think if any any of you live abroad, you you understand this feeling like you're kind of in a fog for, it, little by little layers, come, uh, pass over where you start to understand the culture, and then you, you can be at uh, maybe at at certain levels, um, but. One, so this artist came in and he's like, oh, you American artists, you always get rid of the hand of the artist. I can't see your, your hand at all in this because these, these shapes that I was using, I was filling in with solid colors um, and, and you couldn't even see one brushstroke. I have some patterning um, that happened in, in, in the background, but basically I was just one color against another. So I had not really thought about that, that, that the artist's hand is, is the presence of the artist in the work. So I went to the art market and I got myself um, some Chinese brushes. And so I began to work in oil paint with the Chinese brush. And I started to break apart the skeleton form um, and try to get uh, some uh, air into the paintings. Um, so this is a couple that I did um, for the commission for the Judd family in Singapore. There was a set of three. Um, and I, I, I started to um, put more um, like Taoist concepts into the work. Um, and so this is something like nature is always in move, movement. It's a very, um, uh, all the states of matter are transient. Um, and, you know, I was living in this very transient changing city so uh, I was kind of thinking about how did that match up with um, some ideas in traditional culture. Uh, so then I, I decided I uh, looked deeper into that and also from talking to Catherine and uh, she suggested, why don't you paint the, the Chinese five elements? Um, so in, I think European alchemy has four elements. In China and other parts of Asia, they have five. Um, but it's not like strictly alchemy. It's, um, they're kind of um, the states of matter and it's also kind of a memory system for things. So you can have body parts that, you know, that are different elements and, um, and, uh, and I don't know, there's a lot written about this stuff, but um, the basic idea is that within every element, 
you have interactions with other elements and sometimes they're positive and sometimes they're negative. So for example, water will put out fire, uh, but water, when it is with wood, wood is kind of like plants. It, it makes the plants grow. So you can have positive and negative. And um, like I said, there's a lot written about this um, kind of thing. But um, um, I kind of, I really did enjoy uh, exploring these ideas that, that were not part of my vocabulary before I got to China. Uh, so I, I rode, um, I used to ride my bike to my studio. Um, and this is the gate of my studio uh, at the little city, uh, which is sadly no longer there. Um, the whole city part was just um, demolished. Um, but um, what I, 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 the bike lanes in Beijing are, are very, very wide and they're tree lined because it's very sunny, it's very dry. And so the light has, I mean, often you hear people talk about the pollution in Beijing, but it, it's not like that every day. And the, 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 the dryness of the air uh, when there's a blue sky creates a really beautiful kind of light. Um, so as I would ride my bike along the bike lanes, the shadows of the trees would be cast onto the bike lane. And it looked to me, it started to look to me like calligraphy uh, as I'm riding over these shadow shapes and with my own shape included. It, it, it made these beautiful, um, beautiful rhythmic patterns. Um, so let's see, uh, my work started to change uh, in, uh, it grew larger and took on different forms. Um, I began to sort of marry painting, calligraphy and poetry um, and then into installation uh, form. Um, so this is um, uh, based uh, on Yeats' poem, uh, W.B. Yeats' poem, Sailing to Byzantium. Um, so his poetry, um, I'll say more about this in the second half, but the, the uh, idea of poetry and painting and calligraphy coming together as the three perfections in Chinese art, it's a very natural um, grouping um, as well. It's considered when the three are all going well, that is considered like the highest form of art. So I, I decided to work off of that idea. Um, as well as a kind of another Taoist concept of, of um, the one part of the installation touches the ground, so it's like the earth and the other goes up to the heavens. Um, and the, the one other thing is you, these windows were open and um, as a result, the air would come through and the piece would sort of breathe. So it was almost like uh, Yeats' a spirit had walked into the room. And there I, was, I, I just love this idea of looking up uh, like you're looking up at a work of art. So, and that's, we're just about to leave Beijing and, and there my kids have grown up. <laughs> so they have um, uh, grown up in Beijing. So, thank you. Thanks, Patty. And, and thank you, Chalice. That was really helpful, um, just sort of setting the stage for all of us understanding uh, what brought you to Asia in the first place, what your studio spaces were like, um, and sort of how, how you started to meet people, the, the people and the places that came to have a big impact on you. Um, for the second part of this, I've asked Chalice and Patty to tell us, uh, kind of dig more into this, this question of how their art evolved during their time abroad. Um, I was curious uh, in our prep conversations, hearing about what new source of, of inspiration they came across, and they've both touched on that a little bit, but have more to say. Um, you know, new artists and new concepts that maybe they hadn't been exposed to before, so they'll tell you more about that. Um, I also have asked them to talk about kind of their first forays into ink painting and really what it was like working with these materials for the first time. Um, and really sort of this, this process, this journey, as they began to integrate um, some new techniques and, and concepts into their own artistic practice um, and really ultimately developing uh, what they would call their own ink language. Um, so I'll kick things back over to Chalice, who will, will tell us about um, uh, the evolution of her art making in Japan. Okay, so I'm... Um... 
Uh, can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I was in college, I discovered this book um, about the philosophy in ink painting um, and how that was embodied by not only the subject matter, but also the materials and the method. Um, my professor at the time, Elizabeth Condon, was also reading this book and we kind of discovered this together. I eventually moved to Japan. She went to China many times and you can see the influence in her work. Um, this is a piece I did when I was in college. I entered it into a member show at the Southern Vermont Art Center and it won a prize. So I was pretty excited. Uh, you can see that there's already some of that influence coming in with the splashed ink style and the background and foreground starting to intermingle. These are some paintings I did uh, when I was in Kamiyama and after several years of living in Japan. And you can really start to see that despite the fact that I'm working in oil painting in a Western mode of uh, portraiture, there's also this foreground and background. There's this gestural mark with the brushwork uh, that is very reminiscent of ink painting. While I was in Japan, I discovered the Gutai uh, school of, of painters and they used their bodies in a way that was very physical. And as someone who studied martial arts for uh, since I was young, I was really fascinated by this. So I went back to grad school and then I ended up making uh, a painting video about the movements of martial arts. So you can see in some of these movements, there's a, a little bit of wrestling, there's a little bit of boxing, there's kind of like this, this yin and yang about martial arts, like there's this flow, even though it's a violent activity. Um, so after grad school, I found my way back to Japan. I missed it a lot and I knew I could pay off my loans and still have time to paint. And I began to uh, take ink painting really seriously. I found a teacher and you can see the number of studies it takes. Like it's, it's one of those things that you have to put the brush mark down. You don't get to go back and fix things. The paper just soaks it right up. So you have to have confidence, but you also have to have precision. So it's just this practice of repetition again and again and again until you get it right, until you can't get it wrong. Um, so this is the work of my teacher, Haruyama Sensei. And so you can see he worked in this sort of traditional style, but he was also able to switch and do a more photorealistic style, um, subject matter that's not necessarily traditional. Uh, so he was a great teacher for me because he saw that I was an artist and saw that I wanted to not just copy, I wanted to learn, but I wanted to make it my own in a way and bring my own experience. So he, he was a, a great teacher and you can see some of his dexterity uh, here. He, would just dip his brush in the water and like slop it on the paper and he wouldn't dab it on the blotting paper to check first. He just had this knowledge through repetition, how much of an ink load he had on his brush, if he had the right amount of water, if he had the right amount of ink, just incredibly hard to do and he'd made it look so easy. So while I was there, I was studying Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and boxing it was actually a lot easier to find those to study rather than Aikido or Judo or the traditional Japanese arts that I had studied in America. They're in Japan, but um, MMA is just really popular. And I was, I was really fascinated by female MMA fighters um, and like this breaking apart of the stereotypes of gender, having grown up often being the only woman in the dojo and studying martial arts, it became pretty clear to me that a lot of the assumptions along gender lines don't hold. Like I've tapped out 250 pound guys a lot of times. Um, like it's not, there's not always uh, this correlation between the traits that we assume are feminine 
and masculine with the gender of a person. And so I was breaking apart uh, some of the stereotypes that had frustrated me uh, about gender um, in these paintings. And I was bringing that into oil painting as well. So you can see the background and the foreground are kind of intermingling. You can see there's like certain areas where it's crisp and detailed and then more gestural areas. And you can see in the background, the handling, I'm also doing that in these paintings, but then there's this added layer um, of gender and sexuality as part of the LGBTQ community. I was really interested in pulling apart these gender signifiers a little bit more. Um, I often use friends to model. Um, and this, this is an international couple who have been my muses for years. Another thing that really fascinated me while I was in Japan was the Takarazuka Theater. So this is an all-female musical troupe and the leading men are incredibly popular and I found that there, um, there's this interesting subversion at the same time as like playing with gender roles. So after studying ink for a while, I started to make my own scrolls. Um, I had a few made and I was fascinated by how things would change. So I did this kind of informal apprenticeship. So in this photo, you can see my ink teacher and my scroll making teacher. Um, so uh, it was really interesting to have like the splashy, like messy ink painting process finish it off with something that is so clean and precise. Um, another aspect is that I, in Amaksa, I was living just south of Nagasaki, which had a history of Christianity in the area. Um, and having grown up in the church, I found this really interesting um, to kind of look at the religion that I had grown up with sort of through a, a fresh, from a fresh perspective, um, I, be, I read Yukio Mishima's Confession of a Mask, um, where he discovers that he's gay looking at a reproduction of a painting of St. Sebastian by Guido Reni. Uh, this book is sort of autobiographical, so I, a lot of people assume that that was true about him. <laughs> but another way of mixing dichotomies was to look at how sensual Renaissance painting was at the same time that it was spiritual. And those two, two things fit together. They're not necessarily in opposition. And so you can see, again, I'm not only dealing with these things in ink, but looking to in integrate it into my oil painting practice. So I came back from Japan and continued painting in ink and in oil. And you can see that work um, at the Southern Vermont Art Center. So thanks. Thank you, Chalice. And Patty, are you ready to dive into your second slideshow? Yes. Um, thanks. Thank you, Chalice. Your brushstrokes are so beautiful. Um, let's see now. Share Thanks. The screen. Okay, so, okay, here we go. Um, okay, so, so in China, um, children start to use a brush very at a very young age. Um, and here are um, some kids, uh, one of them's mine, uh, using uh, flowers uh, that they found as brushes and writing characters with, with water. So uh, calligraphy is a daily practice. Um, so the, the rituals of practice increase uh, fluency. So I, I went to visit uh, at one point a calligrapher who was showing me his work. And then as I'm leaving, I saw his trash can and I realized like, okay, this is what it takes. But you can see that the, the lines, it just 
beautiful shapes, the turns of the wrist and the use of the brush is very skilled. So talking about the brush, um, the Chinese and the European brushes um, are very different. Um, so the European brush is more planar and um, in other words, creating um, flat areas of color where the Chinese brush is linear. Um, so uh, I guess uh, more to say about that is, is also that um, there's, um, as well as going back and forth, the Chinese brush also goes up and down. Th these bristles are very soft. So when you push on the brush, you, 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 you can use it in, in it's much more versatile in many different ways. So the calligrapher um, holds a brush like this. Often painters will modify this, but um, this is the, the proper way to hold the brush, completely vertical, these two fingers in front, these two fingers in back, and straight up and down. Um, and there's some philosophy around this that, um, you know, the energy, the natural energy, it's just called qi, uh, comes, you know, kind of from the universe or from nature into the body of the artist and then through uh, from the body into the brush. And so the ink is sort of this connection through a chain of events, a connection to the to the hand. And the, the very point of the brush is where um, uh, the, all the power is, like everything is concentrated. And when the artist is holding the brush vertically like this, um, they can't even really see the tip of the brush. Um, so it's a kind of a mental connection that they're making um, with, with the brush. It takes concentration. Um, so in um, calligraphy also, uh, this is something I learned when um, my neighbor who was a, 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 a traditional ink painter um, was, was showing me how to draw a line and that I just drew it like straight across with the brush and he said, oh no, you have to, you lead into it and then you actually roll the brush and turn it around back into itself to stop the line. Um, and all the characters are based, um, uh, they're all, um, the way a character is drawn um, uh, is a pattern of stroke, which has a structure within itself. If you do the horizontal line, then this line is going to go into the middle. So there's a logic, a uh, very strong logic to drawing characters. So um, the materials used in, um, in, in Chinese painting are all, like I was using these very hard materials, they're all very soft. So you have this soft brush and you have this soft ink and then this long fibered paper. So as soon as you touch the paper with the ink, it's like Chalice was saying, it, it starts to absorb. It starts to, um, it's, it's painting almost like it's painting itself. So the, basically your emotional state that you're in or whatever you're thinking about, whatever is happening in your mind is going to come out onto the paper. Um, so it, it, traditionally, it's a way to build moral characters through painting. So here, the um, the artist, the presence of the artist is is just there inherent in the medium. Like um, you can generally, like a if you go to a museum and you you look at the ink paintings, um, even if they seem very foreign or different to you, you can just start to look at the strokes. How did the artist's hand move? And you can start to kind of read, read the painting. So this was something that really interests me. The um, landscape painting in China uh, is called Shan Chui, which means mountain and water. And Again, this is a like a Taoist concept, like yin yang, where you have um, you're playing with the playing with opposites. So a mountain is like a very hard material, and a water is a very soft material. Um, so the uh, traditional painter would imagine um, the uh, create the mountain. They're not always usually actually not from nature, usually imaginary. So create the mountain and then. Um, have this idea of the water flowing down the mountain, but also creating it, it 
an interesting way for the water to go down. So the water will have starts and stops. Um, so you have this hard mountain and this soft water, um, uh, but as well, though, even though the water is soft, it, it can wear away a mountain. So you have the, the you know, different tensions within that. I, I wanted to include the second image um, because I think of even of contemporary art in the world, some of the most interesting art is being made by ink painters. Um, and if you have any interest, there's a, a gallery in Beijing called Ink Studio, and they have a lot of videos on their um, site. Um, and this is one woman, uh, she's a performance artist as well as an ink painter. And she literally did the Shan Chui, the mountain water, by putting fabric down a mountain and dumping ink. So it, it, dumping ink down the mountain. So you can see where it, it kind of goes down and lands. And, um, and I'm trying to direct my lines the same way, like as if this is a mountain, uh, how, how would the water flow down? So it, it's a way to kind of use your imagination or your mind to create an interesting composition. So here are a few more works where um, I'm thinking about the, the, the white of the paper is considered like the, the air or the wind and the, the black is considered the bone, so the structure and um, how to give air in, inside the work. So this is my neighbor, um, Yongmin. He, um, he paints in a landscape, uh, landscape painting style um, that's traditional, um, it's called the blue-green style. Um, and he creates a, a painting first, like the skeleton in black ink. And then he fills it in with, um, colors it with mineral pigments um, in, in uh, blue and both blue and green. Um, I wanted to include this because of how he's holding his brush, um, which is actually very difficult. <laughs> um, uh, and he simultaneously has green on one brush and blue on the other. So he, he shifts his hand to paint. Um, and there's some ink painters who do that with water on one brush and, and, and ink on the other. Um, and uh, to contrast, um, this is his girlfriend who works, uh, also it's traditional, but she's using uh, ink wash painting. So it's, she's, her brush is very big and um, it's much looser using ink and water. Um, and in fact, she um, even sitting on her work as she, as she paints, she gets right into the middle of it. So I um, was invited um, to exhibit um, in Dublin Castle. Um, it, uh, a, a lot of people don't know this, but um, the president of Ireland is a poet. Um, and so I was invited to um, respond to his poetry and ink. Um, so uh, then I also brought along the, the Yeats uh, uh, painting. Um, so here are a few of those uh, from a poem of his called In the Beginning. Um, and I have these on my website um, uh, in book form if you're interested in his poetry. So um, this is an exhibit I had this summer at the Southern Vermont Art Center. Um, I had seen the room um, before doing the work um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and then um, everything sort of immediately shut down. And so I was working on these. Um, and the idea goes back to the room was very, had a lot of wood in it. This is a piano and there's some benches in the wooden floor. So balancing that with the blue is kind of a water, feeling of water. Um, and again, the, from the earth to heaven, uh, bringing the work from the earth to heaven. And um, the, the, even though it's sort of watery, what, what my inspiration was actually from trees. Um, so doing the trees in kind of a, a watery style. Is, um, and this is the installation that is now, uh, will be hanging um, for the next month at the Southern Vermont Art Center uh, that Allison mentioned as part of Women Take Wilson. 
also based on Yeats, um, using colors um, like kind of inspired by five elements in the sun and the moon and going from the earth uh, to heaven. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, Patty. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that brings us to uh, the final section of tonight's program, which is an opportunity to hear questions from our audience. Um, but first, just a big thanks to Chalice and Patty for all the work they put into creating those slideshows. Um, I know that they both had to go through hundreds of images <laughs> uh, from their years living in China and Japan. Um, it, was, it was no small effort. And I think they both put together just really a beautiful presentation that, that shows the, the arc of their personal journeys um, while they were living uh, overseas. And a lot of things really resonated for me and what you both had to say, um, especially these, these ideas around the rituals of practice. I think you both shared images of just the repetition, um, how much repetition is needed. Uh, that I found that, that really quite profound. Um, and that your journeys were, were kind of so much more than just an acquisition of techniques, but it, it seems like both of you really kind of shifted into a new frame of mind, a new state of mind in terms of thinking about um, your art um, and what you want to communicate through your painting. Um, so thank you for, for making that so visual for us. Uh, thanks, Allison. It's, it really is interesting to go live in another country when you're an artist because you sort of immediately have there's there's an art community somewhere there's somebody making something somewhere and then also to just kind of a record of what mm. what you're seeing and feeling uh at the time mm. feel very grateful that yeah I, I it was a privilege to be able to share the experience with all of you and to hear more about your experience, Patty, and uh, thank you, Allison, for giving us this opportunity. <laughs> um, so let's hear some questions from the audience. Uh, we, we are going to ask, just because there's 48 of us online tonight, um, that you use the chat function if you have a question or comment you'd like to share. So for those of you who may not be familiar with that, if you wave your cursor towards the bottom of your screen, you should see a little text box, an icon of a text box and the word chat. And if you click on that, um, you will pull up uh, the group chat and you can just type in your question or your comment there. Um, it is public, so just know that, that what you're typing, everyone will see. Um, and as questions come in and comments come in, I'll, I'll narrate them and I'll kind of bounce them over to, uh, to Patty and to Chalice. Um, so there's a first question from Janet, which is to Patty, uh, asking what the material of the large installation is. I, I believe, um, Janet, you're asking about the one that's currently on view at SVAC. So Patty, what's, what is the... Okay. So, um, yeah, so the material, uh, it's voile, and I get it, um, from a theater supply company. Um, so it's, it comes in very wide width. So it's about, um, like I said, it was about nine feet wide. And I use that same material um, uh, in Wilson as I used for the one that I showed in Dublin Castle. Um, and the reason why I really like that one is the width um, and it's transparent and it hangs very beautifully um, as well. It's like fire coated and sometimes that's important when you're doing public work um, that um, there's this kind of a, a safety label that comes along with it and um, uh, yeah so so it's 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 wall is the material and then and just to clarify Janet, i was actually interested in the the pieces that were on view in yester house um, so what material? Oh, sorry, that was my bad. I, I okay, don't... okay, and that those were all done on Japanese paper. Um, so um, I had a few different sources within Japan, um, a couple of paper companies, um, and actually that that became a little bit of an issue in the pandemic because um, Japan stopped 
ship, shipping um, between the US and Japan, and I think also between Europe and Japan. So then I found local sources. So there are um, different places, but that's all paper, very strong um, Japanese paper. Okay. And then we have another question about materials from Susan, who'd like to know what type of ink you both used. Was it Sumi ink or something else uh, that you've used? I use Sumi ink. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so like, like this kind of a thing. And then just rubbing it on a grinding stone. Oh yeah, I also use uh, Sumi ink. Uh, I use some that comes in a paste or I get the, the liquid one. Um, yeah, so Sumi ink. All right, and then we have a question from Terry, who is interested to hear both of you talk about um, ideas around spontaneity, fluidity, and the immediacy of your painting ink. Can you, can you speak to those questions? Do you want to go first, Chalice? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure thanks. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, there's definitely um, spontaneity and immediacy uh, in ink painting. Like, because of the way the materials react, you can't plan everything. Like, um, my teacher, when I did a, an excellent mistake, he'd always come over and be like, it's, it was like Guzan, like this happy accident. Um, and it sort of forces you to let go in a way um so there's i think that uh, that also bled into my oil painting part of why i leave so much unfinished is to keep that feeling of spontaneity like the just the beginning of something like endless possibility yeah i, I would agree with chalice that it um because i was doing that very controlled line and like erasing and redrawing and to then ink, which is, um, uh, it's not like you have no control, like you have some idea, but you really have to, there's like a, there's another party that comes in. So it's yourself and your brush and your idea, but then it's almost like, I don't know how you want to describe it, like the tea or the God or something, something comes in and is also, it, it's physics that is coming in and making your work as well. So. Uh, yeah, like Chalice was saying, the, the fibers of the paper are very long. And then um, you can buy some that has sizing, like a rabbit skin glue or animal skin glue sizing, and some that doesn't have it. And the one that doesn't have it, um, it, it the, the ink will just keep going, like almost like if you put ink on a paper towel, like it just keeps going. Um, um, and uh, yeah, then depending, and sometimes you want that, you know, um, and then other times, depending on how much size. So you, different papers will do different things as well. So the paper is a, like a participant in, in the whole process, as well as the brush and then the water and, um, and your mental state at the time. Uh, um, yeah. It's exciting. I think almost anyone, like forget if you have art background or anything like that, if you pick up a Chinese brush and just get the cheap ink, and this whatever sumi paper um or even just regular paper i think once people if you just dip that brush and start to make lines on a paper it's super addictive because mm -hmm. of that feeling like you're not controlling the whole thing you, you watch if just draw parallel lines whatever it is it's it's so soothing and beautiful and addictive and it's almost like any any of them look beautiful like the material is beautiful. It's all from nature. The paper's from nature. The brush, the the ink. Um, it, it, no matter what you do with it, it's kind of going to look beautiful, you know. So we all have a homework assignment now. Yeah, even just <laughs> <it> the line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Here's another question from Anthony, uh, who was curious. Um, if you could both talk about uh, sort of comparing, contrasting the ease or difficulty of being a professional artist in Japan and China versus in the United States. 
Mm. I think in my experience in Japan, uh, the art world was smaller. So I felt like there was less, less of a ladder to climb in a way. Like it was, it was, I had these cross connecting networks very quickly because the art world is so small. Um, but that also means that there's not the market that there is in New York. Um, a lot of my Japanese friends who were artists were envious of me for being an American because LA, New York, Chicago, Miami, um, it's easier to like make a life as an artist in a place that has an economy that supports the arts as large as ours. I think it's quite different in China. Well, the, especially the time period that I was in, I mean, was first of all, you had um, anyone who was my age had basically grown up in the cultural revolution and pretty much grew up poor. And then there was this kind of like, like I said, this sort of rising middle class um, uh, and the excitement around that, educating children, sending kids to art school, also because so much was uh, taken or forbidden and during the Cultural Revolution, that, that everybody was interested in ink painting and tradition. And the oil painters were phenomenal. Like the supplies were affordable. Like there were a lot of things that came together. And then there were buyers because of the economy and they, they valued art. They, mm -hmm. uh, I, I never came across a culture that valued art like I saw in China. I mean, I had one woman who purchased, she bought a couple of my works. She was 21. She said, I want to, I want to be a collector. And I'm like, okay. But it, it was beautiful in a way because she just, she, she valued art. Um, so I would say China was, and also there's big spaces, museums like being built. And so there's an audience, there's spaces. There, there was the combination. Things have changed quite a bit since I left. Um, so I would say China easier, Japan harder than in America um, in the sense of um, kind of didn't have, the, I, there were not a lot of buyers um, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of spaces to exhibit. Um, artists tend to do rental, uh, rent a space for a weekend, like exhibits are really short. Um, it's really hard to be an artist, I think, in Japan. It's beautiful in terms of, um, um, everything there is to learn in Japan, it's, that end of it is phenomenal. And the kind of supplies you can get, all of that, just the, that kind of beauty. But in terms of actually like kind of selling your work um, or yeah, surviving as an artist, probably Japan is harder um, than America. Mm -hmm. generally. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it looks like we are at 8.01, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so we'll, we'll wrap things up now. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but I will save this chat and share it with, with Patty and Chalice um, so maybe they can follow up with those of you whose questions we didn't get to, to talk about. Um, before we sign off, I did just want to make a couple of announcements about some upcoming events at SCAC that might be of interest to you. Um, the first, of course, is a reminder to, to come on up uh, before November 29th if you haven't had a chance to see um, these installations. They'll be on view until then. Um, Chalice is teaching two upcoming art classes. Uh, so if you are um, interested in learning more about ink painting, you can take an intro to ink painting weekend course on November 7th and 8th. And she's also offering an introduction to oil painting on December 5th and 6th. Um, and both these courses are, are going to be offered online. Um, so you can do them from home and there's information about the supplies you need and how to register on the website. Um, so those are great opportunities. Uh, I encourage you to check those out. Um, and then we have one more program coming up soon on November 14th. We are hosting the artist Adrienne Brown. She's, uh, she will be um, at SVAC in person for a Meet the Artist reception and program. And Corso, our executive director, is going to be in conversation with her. 
Um, and uh, Adrienne's work, her photography, is uh, another part of the Women Take Women Women Take Wilson exhibition series. Um, so it's also on view until November 29th. Um, so if you're available on the 14th, that's a Saturday afternoon, uh, please register through our website. Um, and again, thank you so much everyone for signing up for this and to Chalice and to Patty for um, sharing their stories with us. Uh, it was, it's been a really great evening. Um, thank you, Allison, for moderating and um, really thanks for, I, mean, I see people's names like who have known me when I'm younger, I haven't seen since, my auntie, Margaret here and um, lots of friends, friends who have visited me in Beijing. So it's very nice to be able to share this. And thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming and listening and looking at what we've both done. And thank you, Patty, for sharing all your stories and, and all the experiences that we have that have interwoven. <laughs> and getting to do this with you is really an honor. And Allison, so glad to have uh, have you as our moderator and connecting point. <laughs> yeah, and seriously, I look at Chalice's class because, um, like I said, don't worry, you're not an artist or whatever. Once you pick up the brush and the ink, it doesn't, like you saw the calligrapher's trash can, like it can all go, you know, but the actual practice, it's, it's what we need right now. It's, it's so soothing. Mm -hmm. It really is. And it's going to be a really fun class. We're just going to like, just move through paper. <laughs> mm. All right, everyone. Well, take care and stay healthy and safe. And Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Night. Thank you.